to circumcision. On the day that the divine infant was circumcised, he received the name of Jesus, which signifies Savior, which had been given him by the angel before he was conceived. That name, so beautiful, so glorious, the divine child does not wish to bear for one moment without fulfilling its meaning. Even at the moment of his circumcision, he showed himself a Savior by shedding for us that blood, a single drop of which is more than sufficient for the ransom and salvation of the whole world. Reflection Let us profit by the circumstance of the new year and of the wonderful renewal wrought in the world by the great mystery of this day to renew in our hearts an increase of fervor and of generosity in the service of God. May this year be one of fervor and of progress. It will go by rapidly like that which has just ended. If God permits us to see its end, how glad and how happy we shall be to have passed it holily. January 2nd St. Fulgentius, Bishop In spite of family troubles and delicate health, Fulgentius was appointed at an early age procurator of his province at Carthage. This success, however, did not satisfy his heart. Levying the taxes proved daily more distasteful, and when he was twenty-two, St. Austin's treatise on the Psalms decided him to enter religion. After six years of peace, his monastery was attacked by Arian heretics, and Fulgentius himself driven out destitute to the desert. He now sought the solitude of Egypt, but finding that country also in schism, he turned his steps to Rome. There the splendors of the imperial court only told him of the greater glory of the heavenly Jerusalem, and at the first lull in the persecution he resought his African cell. Elected bishop in 508, he was summoned forth to face new dangers, and was shortly after banished by the Arian king, Thrasimund, with fifty-nine orthodox prelates, to Sardinia. Though the youngest of the exiles, he was at once the mouthpiece of his brethren and the stay of their flocks. By his books and letters, which are still extant, he confounded both Pelagian and Arian heresies and confirmed the Catholics in Africa and Gaul. An Arian priest betrayed Fulgentius to the Numidians and ordered him to be scourged. This was done. His hair and beard were plucked out, and he was left naked, his body one bleeding sore. Even the Arian bishop was ashamed of this brutality and offered to punish the priest if the saint would prosecute him. But Fulgentius replied, A Christian must not seek revenge in this world. God knows how to right his servant's wrongs. If I were to bring the punishment of man on that priest, I should lose my own reward with God. And it would be a scandal to many little ones that a Catholic and a monk, however unworthy he be, should seek redress from an Arian bishop. On Thrasimund's death, the bishops returned to their flocks, and Fulgentius, having re-established discipline in his see, retired to an island monastery, where after a year's preparation he died in peace in the year 533. Reflection Each year may bring us fresh changes and trials. Let us learn from St. Fulgentius to receive all that happens as from the hand of God and appointed for our salvation. Also January 2nd, St. Macarius of Alexandria. Macarius, when a youth, left his fruit stall at Alexandria to join the great St. Antony. The patriarch, warned by a miracle of his disciple's sanctity, named him the heir of his virtues. His life was one long conflict with self. I am tormenting my tormentor, replied he to one who he met bent double with a basket of sand in the heat of the day. Whenever I am slothful and idle, I am pestered by desires for distant travel. When he was quite worn out, he returned to his cell. 
since sleep at times overpowered him, he kept watch for twenty days and nights. Being about to faint, he entered his cell and slept, but henceforth slept only at will. A gnat stung him. He killed it. In revenge for this softness, he remained naked in a marsh till his body was covered with noxious bites, and he was recognized only by his voice. Once, when thirsty, he received a present of grapes, but passed them untouched to a hermit who was toiling in the heat. This one gave him to a third, and who handed them to a fourth. Thus the grapes went the round of the desert, and returned to Macarius, who thanked God for his brethren's abstinence. Macarius saw demons assailing the hermits at prayer. They put their fingers into the mouths of some and made them yawn. They closed the eyes of others and walked upon them when asleep. They placed vain and sensual images before many of the brethren, and then mocked those who were captivated by them. None vanquished the devils effectually save those who by constant vigilance repelled them at once. Macarius visited one hermit daily for four months, but never could speak to him, as he was always in prayer. So he called him an angel on earth. After being many years superior, Macarius fled in disguise to St. Pacimonius to begin again as his novice. But St. Pacimonius, instructed by a vision, bade him return to his brethren, who loved him as their father. In his old age, thinking nature tamed, he determined to spend five days alone in prayer. On the third day the cell seemed on fire, and Macarius came forth. God permitted this delusion, he said, lest he be ensnared by pride. At the age of seventy-three he was driven into exile and brutally outraged by the Arian heretics. He died A.D. 394. Reflection Prayer is the breath of the soul, but St. Macarius teaches us that mind and body must be brought to subjection before the soul is free to pray. January 3rd, St. Genevieve, Virgin Genevieve, or Genevieve, was born at Nanterre near Paris. St. Germanus, when passing through, specially noted a little shepherdess and predicted her future sanctity. At seven years of age she made a vow of perpetual chastity. After the death of her parents, Paris became her abode, but she often traveled on works of mercy, which, by the gifts of prophecy and miracles, she unfailingly performed. At one time she was cruelly persecuted. Her enemies, jealous of her power, called her a hypocrite and tried to drown her. But St. Germanus, having sent her some blessed bread as a token of esteem, the outcry ceased, and every afterwards she was honored as a saint. During the siege of Paris by Chelderic, king of the Franks, Genevieve went out with a few followers and procured corn for the starving citizens. Nevertheless, Chelderic, though a pagan, respected her, and at her request spared the lives of many prisoners. By her exhortations again, when Attila and his Huns were approaching the city, the inhabitants, instead of taking flight, gave themselves to prayer and penance, and averted, as she had foretold, the impending scourge. Clovis, when converted from paganism by his holy wife, St. Clotilda, made Genevieve his constant adviser, and in spite of his violent character, became a generous and Christian king. She died within a few weeks of that monarch in 512, aged 89. A pestilence broke out at Paris in 1129, which in a short time swept off 14,000 persons, and in spite of all human efforts, daily added to its victims. At length, on November 26, the shrine of St. Genevieve was carried in solemn procession through the city. That same day, but three persons died, the rest recovered, and no others were taken ill. This was but the first of a series of miraculous favors which the city of Paris has obtained through the relics of its patron saint.
Reflection Genevieve was only a poor peasant girl, but Christ dwelt in her heart. She was anointed with His Spirit and with power. She went about doing good, and God was with her. January 4th St. Titus, Bishop Titus was a convert from heathenism, a disciple of St. Paul, one of the chosen companions of the Apostle in his journey to the Council of Jerusalem, and his fellow laborer in many apostolic missions. From the second epistle, which St. Paul sent by the hand of Titus to the Corinthians, we gain an insight into his character and understand the strong affection which his master bore him. Titus had been commissioned to carry out a twofold office, needing much firmness, discretion, and charity. He was to be the bearer of a severe rebuke to the Corinthians, who were giving scandal and were wavering in their faith and at the same time he was to put their charity to a further test by calling upon them for abundant alms for the church at Jerusalem. St. Paul, meanwhile, was anxiously awaiting the result. At Troas he writes, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. He set sail to Macedonia. Here at last Titus brought the good news. His success had been complete. He reported the sorrow, the zeal, the generosity of the Corinthians, till the apostle could not contain his joy, and sent back to them his faithful messenger with the letter of comfort from which we have quoted. Titus was finally left as a bishop in Crete, and here he in turn received the epistle which bears his name, and here at last he died in peace. The mission of Titus to Corinth shows us how well the disciple caught the spirit of his master. He knew how to be firm and to inspire respect. The Corinthians, we are told, received him with fear and trembling. He was patient and painstaking. St. Paul gave thanks to God, who had put such carefulness for them in the heart of Titus. And these gifts were enhanced by a quickness to detect and call out all that was good in others and by a joyousness which overflowed upon the spirit of St. Paul himself, who abundantly rejoiced in the joy of Titus. Reflection Saints win their empire over the hearts of men by their wide and affectionate sympathy. This was the characteristic gift of St. Titus, as it was of St. Paul, St. Francis Xavier, and many others. Also, January 4th, St. Gregory, Bishop St. Gregory was one of the principal senators of Autun and continued from the death of his wife, a widower, till the age of fifty-seven, at which time, for his singular virtues, he was consecrated Bishop of Langris, which, see, he governed with admirable prudence and zeal thirty-three years, sanctifying his pastoral labors by the most profound humility, assiduous prayer, and extraordinary abstinence and mortification. An incredible number of infidels were converted by him from idolatry, and worldly Christians from their disorders. He died about the beginning of the year 541, but some days after the Epiphany. Out of devotion to St. Benanis, he desired to be buried near that saint's tomb at Dijon. This was executed by his virtuous son Tetricus, who succeeded him in his bishopric. January 5th, St. Simeon Stylites One winter's day, about the year 401, the snow lay thick around Sisan, a little town in Cilicia. A shepherd boy, who could not lead his sheep to the fields on account of the cold, went to the church instead and listened to the eight Beatitudes, which were read that morning. He asked how these blessings were to be obtained, and when he was told of the monastic life, a thirst for perfection arose within him. He became the wonder of the world, the great St. Simeon Stylites. He was warned that perfection would cost him dear, and so it did. A mere child, he began the monastic life, and therein passed a dozen years in superhuman austerity. He bound a rope round his waist, 
until the flesh was putrefied. He ate but once in seven days, and when God led him to a solitary life, kept fasts of forty days. Thirty-seven years he spent on the top of pillars, exposed to heat and cold, day and night adoring the majesty of God. Perfection was all in all to St. Simeon, the means nothing except in so far as God chose them for him. The solitaries of Egypt were suspicious of a life so new and so strange, and they sent one of their number to bid St. Simeon come down from his pillar and return to the common life. In a moment the saint made ready to descend, but the Egyptian religious was satisfied with this proof of humility. Stay, he said, and take courage. Your way of life is from God. Cheerfulness, humility, and obedience set their seal upon the austerities of St. Simeon. The words which God put into his mouth brought crowds of heathen to baptism and of sinners to penance. At last, in the year 460, those who watched below noticed that he had been motionless three whole days. They ascended and found the old man's body still bent in the attitude of prayer, but his soul was with God. Extraordinary as the life of St. Simeon may appear, it teaches us two plain and practical lessons. First, we must constantly renew within ourselves an intense desire for perfection. Secondly, we must use with fidelity and courage the means of perfection God points out. Reflection St. Augustine says, This is the business of our life, by effort and by toil, by prayer and supplication, to advance in the grace of God till we come to that height of perfection in which, with clean hearts, we may behold God. January 6th, the Epiphany of Our Lord The word epiphany means manifestation, and it has passed into general acceptance throughout the universal church from the fact that Jesus Christ manifested to the eyes of men his divine mission on this first day of all, when a miraculous star revealed his birth to the kings of the East, who in spite of the difficulties and dangers of a long and tedious journey through deserts and mountains almost impassable, hastened at once to Bethlehem, to adore him, and to offer him mystical presents, as to the King of kings, to the God of heaven and earth, and to a man with all feeble and mortal. The second manifestation was when going out from the waters of the Jordan, after having received baptism from the hands of St. John, the Holy Ghost descended on him in the visible form of a dove, and a voice from heaven was heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The third manifestation was that of his divine power, when at the marriage feast of Cana he changed the water into wine, at the sight whereof his disciples believed in him. The remembrance of these three great events, concurring to the same end, the Church has wished to celebrate in one and the same festival. Reflection Admire the almighty power of this little child, who from his cradle makes known his coming to the shepherds and magi, to the shepherds by means of his angel, to the magi by a star in the east. Admire the docility of these kings. Jesus is born. Behold them at his feet. Let us be little. Let us hide ourselves, and the divine strength will be granted to us. Let us be docile and quick in following divine inspirations, and we shall then become wise of the wisdom of God, powerful of his almighty power. January 7th St. Lucian Martyr. St. Lucian was born at Samosata in Syria. Having lost his parents in his youth, he distributed all his worldly goods, of which he inherited an abundant share, to the poor, and withdrew to Edessa, to live near a holy man named Macarius, who imbued his mind with the knowledge of the holy scriptures, and led him to the practice of the Christian virtues. Having become a priest, his time was divided between the external duties of his holy state 
the performance of works of charity, and the study of sacred literature. He revised the books of the Old and New Testaments, expunging the errors which had found their way into the text, either through the negligence of copyists or the malice of heretics, thus preparing the way for St. Jerome, who shortly after was to give to the world the Latin translation known as the Vulgate. Having been denounced as a Christian, Lucian was thrown into prison and condemned to the torture, which was protracted for twelve whole days. Some Christians visited him in prison on the Feast of the Epiphany and brought bread and wine to him. While bound and chained down on his back, he consecrated the divine mysteries upon his own breast and communicated the faithful who were present. He finished his glorious career in prison and died with the words, I am a Christian, on his lips. Reflection If we would keep our faith pure, we must study its holy truths. We cannot detect falsehood till we know and love the truth. And to us the truth is not an abstraction, but a person, Jesus Christ, God, and man. January 8th St. Apollinaris, the Apologist, Bishop Claudius Apollinaris, Bishop of Hierapolis in Phrygia, was one of the most illustrious prelates of the Second Age. Notwithstanding the great encomiums bestowed on him by Eusebius, St. Jerome, Theodoret, and others, but little is known of his actions, and his writings, which then were held in great esteem, seem now to be all lost. He wrote many able treatises against the heretics, and pointed out, as St. Jerome testifies, from what philosophical sect each heresy derived its errors. Nothing rendered his name so illustrious, however, as his noble apology for the Christian religion which he addressed to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius about the year 175, soon after the miraculous victory that prince had obtained over the Quadi by the prayers of the Quist Christians. St. Apollinaris reminded the Emperor of the benefit he had received from God through the prayers of his Christian subjects and implored protection for them against the persecution of the pagans. Marcus Aurelius published an edict in which he forbade anyone under pain of death to accuse a Christian on account of his religion, but by a strange inconsistency he had not the courage to abolish the laws then in force against the Christians, and as a consequence many of them suffered martyrdom, though their accusers were also put to death. The date of St. Apollinaris's death is not known. The Roman martyrology mentions him on the 8th of January. Reflection. Therefore I say unto you, all things whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe that you shall receive, and they shall come unto you. January 9th. Saints Julian and Basilissa, Martyrs. Saint Julian and Saint Basilissa, though married, lived by mutual consent in perpetual chastity. They sanctified themselves by the most perfect exercises of an ascetic life and employed their revenues in relieving the poor and the sick. For this purpose, they converted their house into a kind of hospital in which they sometimes entertained a thousand poor people. Basilissa attended those of her sex in separate lodgings from the men. These were taken care of by Julian, who from his charity is named the Hospitalarian. Egypt, where they lived, had then begun to abound with examples of persons who, either in the cities or in the deserts, devoted themselves to the most perfect exercises of charity, penance, and mortification. Basilissa, after having stood seven persecutions, died in peace. Julian survived her many years and received the crown of a glorious martyrdom, together with Celsus, a youth, Antony, a priest, Anastasius, and Marcianella, the mother of Celsus. Many churches and hospitals in the East, and especially in the West, bear the name of one or other of these martyrs. 
four churches at Rome and three out of five at Paris, which bear the name of St. Julian, were originally dedicated under the name of St. Julian, the Hospitalarian and Martyr. In the time of St. Gregory the Great, the skull of St. Julian was brought out of the East into France and given to Queen Brunehaut. She gave it to the nunnery, which she founded, part of it as present in the monastery of Monnier near Etampes, and part in the church of the regular canonesses of St. Vesalissa at Paris. Reflection God often rewards men for works that are pleasing in His sight by giving them grace and opportunity to do other works higher still. St. Augustine said, I have never seen a compassionate and charitable man die a bad death. January 10th, St. William, Archbishop William Berrier, of the illustrious family of the ancient Counts of Nevers, was educated by Peter the Hermit, Archdeacon of Soissons, his uncle by the mother's side. From his infancy, William learned to despise the folly and emptiness of the world, to abhor its pleasures, and to tremble at its dangers. His only delight was in exercises of piety and in his studies, in which he employed his whole time with indefatigable application. He was made canon, first of Sessouan and afterward of Paris, but he soon resolved to abandon the world and retired into the solitude of Grandma, where he lived with great regularity in that austere order until finally he joined the Cistercians, then in wonderful odor of sanctity. After some time, he was chosen prior of the abbey of Pontigny and afterwards became abbot of Chaly. On the death of Henri de Sully, Archbishop of Bouget, William was chosen to succeed him. The announcement of his new dignity, which had fallen on him, overwhelmed him with grief, and he would not have accepted the office had not the Pope and his general, the abbot of Citeaux, commanded him to do so. His first care in his new position was to conform his life to the most perfect rules of sanctity. He redoubled all his austerities, saying it was incumbent on him now to do penance for others as well as for himself. He always wore a hair shirt under his religious habit and never added to his clothing in winter or diminished it in summer. He never ate any flesh meat, though he had it at his table for strangers. When he drew near his end, it was, at his request, laid on ashes in his hair cloth, and, in this posture, expired on the 10th of January, 1209. His body was interred in his cathedral, and being honored by many miracles, was taken up in 1217, and in the year following, William was canonized by Pope Honorius III. Reflection the champions of faith prove the truth of their teaching no less by the holiness of their lives than by the force of their arguments. Never forget that to convert others we must first see to our own souls. January 11th, St. Theodosius, the Cenobiarch. Theodosius was born in Cappadocia in 423, the example of Abraham urged him to leave his country, and his desire to follow Jesus Christ attracted him to the religious life. He placed himself under Loginus, a very holy hermit, who sent him to govern a monastery near Bethlehem. Unable to bring himself to command others, he fled to a cavern where he lived in penance and prayer. His great charity, however, forbade him to refuse the charge of some disciples, who few at first became in time a vast number, and Theodosius built a large monastery and three churches for them. He became eventually superior of the religious communities of Palestine. Theodosius accommodated himself so carefully to the characters of his subjects that his reproofs were loved rather than dreaded. But once he was obliged to separate from the communion of the others a religious guilty of a grave fault, Instead of humbly accepting his sentence, the monk was arrogant enough to pretend to excommunicate Theodosius in revenge. 
Theodosius thought not of indignation, nor of his own position, but meekly submitted to this false and unjust excommunication. This so touched the heart of his disciple that he submitted at once and acknowledged his fault. Theodosius never refused assistance to any in poverty or affliction. On some days the monks laid more than a hundred tables for those in want. In times of famine Theodosius forbade the alms to be diminished and often miraculously multiplied the provisions. He also built five hospitals, in which he lovingly served the sick, while by assiduous spiritual reading he maintained himself in perfect recollection. He successfully opposed the Euchian heresy in Jerusalem, and for this was banished by the emperor. He suffered a long and painful malady, and refused to pray to be cured, calling it a salutary penance for his former successes. He died at the age of a hundred and six. Reflection St. Theodosius, for the sake of charity, sacrificed all he most prized, his home for the love of God, and his solitude for the love of his neighbor. Can ours be true charity if it costs us little or nothing? January 12th St. Alred, Abbot One thing thou lackest, in these words God called Alred from the court of a royal saint, David of Scotland, to the silence of the cloister. He left the king, the companions of his youth, and a friend most dear, to obey the call. The conviction that in the world his soul was in danger alone enabled him to break such ties, Long afterwards the bitterness of the parting remained fresh in his soul, and he declared that though he had left his dear ones in the body to serve his Lord, his heart was ever with them. He entered the Cistercian order, and even there his yearning for sympathy showed itself in a special attraction to one among the brethren named Simon. This holy monk had left the world in his youth, and appeared as one deaf and dumb, so absorbed was he in God. One day, Alred, forgetting for the moment the rule of perpetual silence, spoke to him. At once he prostrated himself at his feet in token of his fault, but Simon's look of pain and displeasure haunted him for many a year, and taught him to let no human feeling disturb for one moment his union with God. A certain novice once came to Alred, saying that he must return to the world, but Alred had begged his soul of God and answered, Brother, ruin not thyself. Nevertheless thou canst not, even though thou wouldst. However, he would not listen, and wandered among the hills, thinking all the while he was going far from the abbey. At sunset he found himself before a convent strangely like Riveau, and so it was. The first monk he met was Alred, who fell on his neck, saying, Son, why hast thou done so with me? Lo, I have wept for thee with many tears, and I trust in God that as I have asked of him, thou shalt not perish. The world does not so love its friends. At the command of his superiors, Alred composed his great works, The Spiritual Friendship and The Mirror of Charity. In the latter, he says that true love of God is only to be obtained by joining ourselves in all things to the passion of Christ. He died in 1167, founder and abbot of Revaux, the most austere monastery in England, and superior of some three hundred monks. Reflection When a man has given himself to God, God gives back friendship with all his other gifts a hundredfold. Friends are then loved no longer for themselves only, but for God, and that with a love lively and tender, for God can easily purify feeling. It is not feeling, but self-love, which corrupts friendship. January 13th, St. Veronica of Milan Veronica's parents were peasants of a village near Milan. From her childhood she toiled hard in the house and the field, and accomplished cheerfully every menial task. Gradually the desire for perfection grew within her, 
she became deaf to the jokes and songs of her companions, and sometimes, when reaping and hoeing, would hide her face and weep. Knowing no letters, she began to be anxious about her learning, and rose secretly at night to teach herself to read. Our Lady told her that other things were necessary, but not this. She showed Veronica three mystical letters which would teach her more than books. The first signified purity of intention, the second abhorrence of murmuring or criticism, the third daily meditation on the Passion. By the first she learned to begin her daily duties for no human motive but for God alone. By the second to carry out what she had thus begun by attending to her own affairs, never judging her neighbor, but praying for those who manifestly erred. By the third she was enabled to forget her own pains and sorrows in those of our Lord, and to weep hourly but silently over the memory of his wrongs. She had constant ecstasies, and saw in successive visions the whole life of Jesus and many other mysteries. Yet by a special grace neither her raptures nor her tears ever interrupted her labors, which ended only with death. After three years' patient waiting she was received as a lay sister in the convent of St. Martha at Milan. The community was extremely poor, and Veronica's duty was to beg through the city for their daily food. Three years after receiving the habit, she was afflicted with a secret but constant bodily pain, yet never would consent to be relieved of any of her labors or to omit one of her prayers. By exact obedience she became a living copy of the rule, and obeyed with a smile the least hint of her superior. She sought to the last the most hard and humbling occupations, and in their performance enjoyed some of the highest favors ever granted to saint. She died in 1497, on the day she had foretold, after a six-month illness, age fifty-two years, and in the thirtieth of her religious profession. Reflection When Veronica was urged in sickness to accept some exemptions from her labors, her one answer was, I must work while I can, while I have time. Dare we then waste hours? January 14, St. Hilary of Portia St. Hilary was a native of Portia in Aquitaine. Born and educated a pagan, it was not till near middle age that he embraced Christianity, moved thereto mainly by the idea of God presented to him in the Holy Scriptures. He soon converted his wife and daughter, and separated himself rigidly from all uncatholic company. In the beginning of his conversion, St. Hilary would not eat with Jews or heretics, nor salute them, by the way, but afterwards for their sake he relaxed this severity. He entered holy orders, and in 353 was chosen bishop of his native city. Arianism, under the protection of the emperor Constantius, was just then in the height of its power. St. Hilary found himself called upon to support the Orthodox cause in several Gaelic councils, in which Arian bishops forming an overwhelming majority. He was in consequence accused to the emperor, who banished him to Phrygia. He spent his three years and more of exile in composing his great works on the Trinity. In 359 he attended the Council of Seleucia, in which Arians, Semi-Arians and Catholics contended for the mastery. With the deputies of the council, he proceeded to Constantinople, and there so dismayed the heads of the Arian party that they prevailed upon the emperor to let him return to Gaul. He traversed Gaul, Italy, and Ilria, wherever he came discomforting the heretics and procuring the triumph of orthodoxy. After seven or eight years of missionary travel, he returned to Portois, where he died in peace in 368. Reflection Like St. Hilary, we too are called to a lifelong contest with heretics. We shall succeed in proportion 
as we combine hatred of heresy with compassion for its victims. January 15th, St. Paul, the First Hermit St. Paul was born in Upper Egypt about the year 230 and became an orphan at the age of 15. He was very rich and highly educated. Fearing lest the tortures or of a terrible persecution might endanger his Christian perseverance, he retired to a remote village. But his pagan brother-in-law denounced him, and St. Paul, rather than remain where his faith was in danger, entered the barren desert, trusting that God would supply his wants. And his confidence was rewarded, for on the spot to which providence led him, he found the fruit of the palm tree for food and its leaves for clothing, and the water of a spring for drink. His first design was to return to the world when the persecution was over, but tasting great delights in prayer and penance, he remained the rest of his life, ninety years, in penance, prayer, and contemplation. God revealed his existence to St. Anthony, who sought him for three days. Seeing a thirsty she-wolf run through an opening in the rocks, Anthony followed her to look for water and found Paul. They knew each other at once and praised God together. When St. Anthony visited him, a raven brought him a loaf, and St. Paul said, See how good God is. For sixty years this bird has brought me half a loaf every day. Now thou art come, Christ has doubled the provision for his servants. Having passed the night in prayer, at dawn of day Paul told Anthony that he was about to die, and asked to be buried in the cloak given to St. Anthony by St. Athanasius. Anthony hastened to fetch it, and on his way back saw Paul rise to heaven in glory. He found his dead body kneeling as if in prayer, and two lions came and dug his grave. Paul died in his one hundred and thirteenth year. Reflection We shall never repent of having trusted in God, for He cannot fail those who lean on Him, nor shall we ever trust in ourselves without being deceived. January 16th, St. Honoratus, Archbishop St. Honoratus was of a counselor Roman family settled in Gaul. In his youth he renounced the worship of idols and gained his elder brother, Venantius, to Christ. Convinced of the hollowness of the things of this world, they wished to renounce it with all its pleasures, but a fond pagan father put continual obstacles in their way. At length, taking with them St. Capres, a holy hermit for their director, they sailed from Marseille to Greece, with the intention to live there unknown in some desert. Venantius soon died happily at Methone, and Honoratus, being also sick, was obliged to return with his conductor. He first led a hermetical life in the mountains near Phrygis. Two small islands lie in the sea near that coast. On the smaller, now known as St. Honor, are saints settled and being followed by others, he there founded the famous monastery of Lerence about the year 400. Some of his followers he appointed to live in community, others who seemed more perfect in separate cells as anchorets. His rule was chiefly borrowed from that of St. Pacimonius. Nothing can be more amiable than the description St. Hilary has given of the excellent virtues of this company of saints, especially of the charity, concord, humility, compunction, and devotion which reigned among them under the conduct of their holy abbot. He was by compulsion consecrated Archbishop of Arles in 426, and died, exhausted with austerities and apostolic labors, in 429. Reflection The soul cannot truly serve God while it is involved in the distractions and pleasures of the world. St. Honoratus knew this, and chose to be a servant of Christ his Lord. Resolve in whatever state you are to live absolutely detached from the world and to separate yourself as much as possible from it. January 17th St. Antony, Patriarch of Monks St. Antony was born in the year 251 in Upper Egypt. 
Hearing at Mass the words, If thou wilt be perfect, go, sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, he gave away all his vast possessions. He then begged an aged hermit to teach him the spiritual life. He also visited various solitaries, copying in himself the principal virtue of each. To serve God more perfectly, Antony entered the desert and immured himself in a ruin, building up the door so none could enter. Here the devils assaulted him most furiously, appearing as various monsters, and even wounding him severely. But his courage never failed, and he overcame them all by confidence in God and by the sign of the cross. One night, whilst Antony was in his solitude, many devils scourged him so terribly that he lay as if dead. A friend found him thus, and believing him dead, carried him home. But when Anthony came to himself, he persuaded his friend to carry him, in spite of his wounds, back to his solitude. Here, prostrate from weakness, he defied the devil, saying, I fear you not, you cannot separate me from the love of Christ. After more vain assaults, the devils fled, and Christ appeared to Antony in glory. His only food was bread and water, which he never tasted before sunset, and sometimes only once or in two, three, or four days. He wore sackcloth and sheepskin, and he often knelt in prayer from sunset to sunrise. Many souls flocked to him for advice, and after twenty years of solitude he consented to guide them in holiness, thus founding the first monastery. His numerous miracles attracted such multitudes that he fled again into solitude, where he lived by manual labor. He expired peacefully at a very advanced age. St. Athanasius, his biographer, says that the mere knowledge of how St. Anthony lived is a good guide to virtue. Reflection The more violent were the assaults of temptation suffered by St. Anthony, the more firmly did he grasp his weapons, namely mortification and prayer. Let us imitate him in this if we wish to obtain victories like his. January 18, St. Peter's Chair at Rome St. Peter, having triumphed over the devil in the east, the latter pursued him to Rome in the person of Simon Magus. He who had formerly trembled at the voice of a poor maid now feared not the very throne of idolatry and superstition. The capital of the empire of the world and the center of impiety called for the zeal of the Prince of Apostles. God had established the Roman Empire and extended its dominion beyond that of any former monarchy for the more easy propagation of his gospel. Its metropolis was of the greatest importance for this enterprise. St. Peter took that province upon himself and repairing to Rome there preached the faith and established his ecclesiastical chair. That St. Peter preached in Rome, founded the church there, and died there by martyrdom under Nero, are facts the most incontestable by the testimony of all writers of different countries who live near that time, persons of unquestionable veracity, and who could not but be informed of the truth in a point so interesting and of its own nature so public and notorious. This is also attested by monuments of every kind, by the prerogatives, rights, and privileges which that church enjoyed from those early ages in consequence of this title. It was an ancient custom observed by churches to keep an annual festival of the consecration of their bishops. The feast of the chair of St. Peter is found in the ancient martyrologies. Christians justly celebrate the founding of this mother church, the center of Catholic communion, in thanksgiving to God for His mercies to His Church and to implore His future blessings. Reflection As one of God's greatest mercies to His Church, let us earnestly beg of Him to raise up in its zealous pastors, eminently replenished with His Spirit, with which He animated His Apostles. January 19th St. Canutus, King and Martyr St. Canutus, king of Denmark, 
was endowed with excellent qualities of both mind and body. It is hard to say whether he excelled more in courage or in conduct and skill in war, but his singular piety eclipsed all his other endowments. He cleared the seas of pirates and subdued several neighboring provinces which infested Denmark with their incursions. The kingdom of Denmark was elective until the year 1660, and when the father of Canutus died, his eldest brother Harold was called to the throne. Harold died after reigning for two years, and Canutus was chosen to succeed him. He began his reign by a successful war against the troublesome, barbarous enemies of the state, and by planting the faith in the conquered provinces. Amid the glory of his victories, he humbly prostrated himself at the foot of the crucifix, laying there his diadem, and offering himself and his kingdom to the King of Kings. After having provided for the peace and safety of his country, he married Eltha, daughter of Robert, Earl of Flanders, who proved a spouse worthy of him. His next concern was to reform the abuses at home. For this purpose he enacted severe but necessary laws for the strict administration of justice, and repressed the violence and tyranny of the great without respect to persons. He continenced and honored holy men, and granted many privileges and immunities to the clergy. His charity and tenderness toward his subjects made him study by all possible ways to make them a happy people. He showed a royal munificence in building and adorning churches, and gave the crown which he wore of exceeding great value to a church in his capital and place of residence, where the kings of Denmark are yet buried. To the virtues which constitute a great king, Canutus added those which prove the great saint. A rebellion having sprung up in his kingdom, the king was surprised at church by the rebels. Perceiving his danger, he confessed his sins at the foot of the altar and received holy communion. Stretching out his arms before the altar, the saint fervently recommended his soul to his Creator. In this posture, he was struck by a javelin thrown through a window and fell a victim for Christ's sake. Reflection The soul of a man is endowed with many noble powers and feels a keen joy in their exercise. But the keenest joy we are capable of feeling consists in prostrating all our powers of mind and heart in humblest adoration before the majesty of God. January 20th St. Sebastian, Martyr St. Sebastian was an officer in the Roman army, esteemed even by the heathen as a good soldier, and honored by the church ever since as a champion of Jesus Christ. Born at Narbonne, Sebastian came to Rome about the year 284, and entered the lists against the powers of evil. He found the twin brothers, Marcus and Marcellinus, in prison for the faith, and when they were near yielding to the entreaties of their relatives, encouraging them to despise flesh and blood and to die for Christ, God confirmed His words by a miracle. Light shone round Him while He spoke, He cured the sick by His prayers, and in this divine strength He led multitudes to the faith, among them the prefect of Rome, with his son Tibertius. He saw His disciples die before Him, and one of them came back from heaven to tell him that his own end was near. It was in a contest of fervor and charity that St. Sebastian found the occasion of martyrdom. The prefect of Rome, after his conversion, retired to his estates in Campania, and took a great number of his fellow converts with him to this place of safety. It was a question whether Polycarp, the priest, or St. Sebastian should accompany the neophytes. Each was eager to stay and face the danger in Rome, and at last the Pope decided that the Roman Church could not spare the services of Sebastian. He continued to labor at the post of danger till he was betrayed by a false disciple. He was led before Diocletian, and at the Emperor's command pierced with arrows and left for dead. But God raised him up again, and of his own accord he went before the Emperor and conjured him to stay the persecution of the church. Again sentenced, 
he was at last beaten to death by clubs and crowned his labors by the merit of a double martyrdom. Reflection Your ordinary occupations will give you opportunities of laboring for the faith. Ask help from St. Sebastian. He was not a priest, nor a religious, but a soldier. January 21st, St. Agnes, Virgin, Martyr St. Agnes was but twelve years old when she was led to the altar of Minerva at Rome and commanded to obey the persecuting laws of Diocletian by offering incense. In the midst of the idolatrous rites she raised her hands to Christ, her spouse, and made the sign of the life-giving cross. She did not shrink when she was bound hand and foot, though the jive slipped from her young hands and the heathens who stood around were moved to tears. The bonds were not needed for her, and she hastened gladly to the place of her torture. Next, when the judge saw that pain had no terrors for her, he inflicted an insult worse than death. Her clothes were stripped off, and she had to stand in the street before a pagan crowd. Yet even this did not daunt her. Christ, she said, will guard his own. So it was. Christ showed by a miracle the value which he sets upon the custody of the eyes. Whilst the crowd turned away their eyes from the spouse of Christ, as she stood exposed to view in the street, there was one young man who dared to gaze at the innocent child with immodest eyes. A flash of light struck him blind, and his companions bore him away half dead with pain and terror. Lastly, her fidelity to Christ was proved by flattery and offers of marriage. But she answered, Christ is my spouse. He chose me first, and his I will be. At length the sentence of death was passed. For a moment she stood erect in prayer, and then bowed her neck to the sword. At one stroke her head was severed from her body, and the angels bore her pure soul to paradise. Reflection her innocence endeared St. Agnes to Christ, as it has endeared her to his church ever since. Even as penitents we may imitate this innocence of hers in our own degree. Let us strictly guard our eyes, and Christ, when he sees that we weep our hearts pure for love of him, will renew our youth and give us back the years which the canker worm has wasted. January 22nd, St. Vincent, Martyr Vincent was archdeacon of the church at Saragossa. Valerian, the bishop, had an impediment in his speech. Thus Vincent preached in his stead, and answered in his name when both were brought before Dacian, the president, during the persecution of Diocletian. When the bishop was sent into banishment, Vincent remained to suffer and to die. First of all he was stretched on the rack, and when he was almost torn asunder, Dacian the president asked him in mockery how he fared now. Vincent answered with joy in his face that he had ever prayed to be as he was then. It was in vain that Dacian struck the executioners and goaded them on in their savage work. Martyr's flesh was torn with hooks. He was bound in a chair of red-hot iron. Lard and salt were rubbed in his wounds, and amid all this he kept his eyes raised to heaven and remained unmoved. He was cast into a solitary dungeon with his feet in the stocks, but the angels of Christ illuminated the darkness and assured Vincent that he was near his triumph. His wounds were now tended to prepare him for fresh torments, and the faithful were permitted to gaze on his mangled body. They came in troops, kissed the open sores, and carried away as relics cloth dipped in his blood. Before the tortures could recommence, the martyr's hour came, and he breathed forth his soul in peace. Even the dead bodies of the saints are precious in the sight of God, and the hand of iniquity cannot touch them. A raven guarded the body of Vincent where it lay flung upon the earth. When it was sunk out at sea, the waves cast it ashore and his relics are preserved to this day in the Augustinian Monastery at Lisbon, 
for the consolation of the Church of Christ. Reflection Do you wish to be at peace amid suffering and temptation? Then make it your principal endeavor to grow in habits of prayer and in union with Christ. Have confidence in Him. He will make you victorious over your spiritual enemies and over yourself. He will enlighten your darkness and sweeten your sufferings, and in your solitude and desolation He will draw nigh to you with His holy angels. January 23rd, St. Raymond of Penafort Born A.D. 1175 of a noble Spanish family, Raymond, at the age of twenty, taught philosophy at Barcelona with marvelous success. Ten years later his rare abilities won for him the degree of doctor in the University of Bologna and many high dignities. A tender devotion to our Blessed Lady, which had grown up with him from childhood, determined him in middle life to renounce all his honors and to enter her order of St. Dominic. There again a vision of the Mother of Mercy instructed him to cooperate with his penitent St. Peter Nolasco and with James, King of Aragon, in founding the Order of Our Lady of Ransom for the redemption of captives. He began this great work by preaching a crusade against the Moors and rousing to penance the Christians enslaved in both soul and body by the infidel. King James of Aragon, a man of great qualities, but held in bond by a ruling passion, was bidden by the saint to put away the cause of his sin. On his delay, Raymond asked for leave to depart from Majorca, since he could not live with sin. The king refused, and forbade under pain of death his conveyance by others. Full of faith, Raymond spread his cloak upon the waters, and tying one end to his staff as a sail, made the sign of the cross and fearlessly stepped upon it. In six hours he was borne to Barcelona, where gathering up his cloak, dry, he stole into his monastery. The king, overcome by this miracle, became a sincere penitent and the disciple of the saint till his death. In 1230, Gregory the Ninth summoned Raymond to Rome, made him his confessor and grand penitentiary, and directed him to compile the Decretals, a collection of the scattered decisions of the popes and councils. Having refused the archbishopric of Tarragona, Raymond found himself in 1238 chosen third general of this order, which post he again succeeded in resigning on the score of his advanced age. His first act, when set free, was to resume his labors among the infidels, and in 1256 Raymond, then eighty-one, was able to report that ten thousand Saracens had received baptism. He died A.D. 1275. Reflection Ask St. Raymond to protect you from that fearful servitude, worse than any bodily slavery, which even one sinful habit tends to form. January 24th, St. Timothy, Bishop, Martyr Timothy was a convert of St. Paul. He was born at Lystra in Asia Minor. His mother was a Jewess, but his father was a pagan. And though Timothy had read the scriptures from his childhood, he had not been circumcised as a Jew. On the arrival of St. Paul at Lystra, the youthful Timothy, with his mother and grandmother, eagerly embraced the faith. Seven years later, when the apostle again visited the country, the boy had grown into manhood, while his good heart, his austerities and zeal had won the esteem of all around him and holy men were prophesying great things for the fervent youth. St. Paul at once saw his fitness for the work of an evangelist. Timothy was forthwith ordained, and from that time became the constant and much-beloved fellow-worker of the Apostle. In company with St. Paul, he visited the cities of Asia Minor and Greece, at one time hastening on in front as a trusted messenger, at another lingering behind to confirm in the faith some recently founded church. Finally, he was made the bishop of Ephesus, and here he received the two epistles which bear his name, 
the first written from Macedonia and the second from Rome, in which St. Paul, from his prison, gives vent to his longing desire to see his dearly beloved son, if possible, once more before his death. St. Timothy himself, not many years after the death of St. Paul, won his martyr's crown at Ephesus. As a child, Timothy delighted in reading the sacred books, and to his last hour he would remember the parting words of his spiritual father, Attende lexioni, apply thyself to reading. Reflection St. Paul, in writing to Timothy, a faithful and well-tried servant of God, and a bishop now getting on in years, addresses him as a child, and seems most anxious about his perseverance in faith and piety. The letters abound in minute personal instructions for his end. It is therefore remarkable what great stress the Apostle lays on the avoiding of idle talk and on the application to holy reading. These are his chief topics. Over and over again he exhorts his son Timothy to avoid tattlers and busybodies, to give no heed to novelties, to shun profane and vain babblings, but to hold the form of sound words, to be an example in word and conversation, to attend to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. January 25th, The Conversion of St. Paul the great apostle Paul, named Saul at his circumcision, was born at Tarsus, the capital of Cilicia, and was by privilege a Roman citizen, to which quality a great distinction and several exemptions were granted by the laws of the empire. He was early instructed in the strict observance of the Mosaic law, and lived up to it in the most scrupulous manner. In his zeal for the Jewish law, which he thought the cause of God, he became a violent persecutor of the Christians. He was one of those who combined to murder St. Stephen, and in the violent persecution of the faithful which followed the martyrdom of the holy deacon, Saul signalized himself above others. By virtue of the power he had received from the high priest, he dragged the Christians out of their houses, loaded them with chains, and thrust them into prison. In the fury of his zeal, he applied for a commission to take up all Jews at Damascus who confessed Jesus Christ and bring them bound to Jerusalem, that they might serve as examples for the others. But God was pleased to show forth in him his patience and mercy. While on his way to Damascus, he and his party were surrounded by a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, and suddenly struck to the ground. And then a voice was heard saying, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? And Saul answered, Who art thou, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, whom thou dost persecute. This mild expostulation of our Redeemer, accompanied with a powerful interior grace, cured Saul's pride, assuaged his rage, and wrought at once a total change in him. Wherefore, Trembling and astonished, he cried out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Our Lord ordered him to arise and to proceed on his way to the city, where he should be informed of what was expected of him. Saul, arising from the ground, found that, though his eyes were open, he saw nothing. He was led by hand into Damascus, where he was lodged in the house of a Jew named Judas. To this house came by divine appointment a holy man named Ananias, who laying his hands on Saul said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to thee on thy journey, hath sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he recovered his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. He stayed home some few days with the disciples at Damascus and began immediately to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. Thus a blasphemer and a persecutor was made an apostle and chosen as one of God's principal instruments in the conversion of the world. Reflection Listen to the words of the imitation of Christ 
and let them sink into your heart. He who would keep the grace of God, let him be grateful for grace when it is given, and patient when it is taken away. Let him pray that it may be given back to him, and be careful and humble, lest he lose it. January 26th, St. Polycarp, Bishop, Martyr St. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, was a disciple of St. John. He wrote to the Philippians, exhorting them to mutual love and to hatred of heresy. When the apostate Marcion met St. Polycarp at Rome, he asked the aged saint if he knew him. Yes, St. Polycarp answered, I know you for the firstborn of Satan. These were the words of a saint most loving and most charitable, and specially noted for his compassion to sinners. He hated heresy because he loved God and man so much. In 167, persecution broke out in Smyrna. When Polycarp heard that his pursuers were at the door, he said, The will of God be done, and meeting them, he begged to be left alone for a little time, which he spent in prayer for the Catholic Church throughout the world. He was brought to Smyrna early on Holy Saturday, and as he entered, a voice was heard from heaven, Polycarp, be strong. When the proconsul besought him to curse Christ and go free, Polycarp answered, Eighty-six years I have served him, and he never did me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and savior? When he threatened him with fire, Polycarp told him, This fire of his lasted but a little, while the fire prepared for the wicked lasted forever. At the stake, he thanked God aloud for letting him drink of Christ's chalice. The fire was lighted, but it did him no hurt, so he was stabbed to the heart, and his dead body was burnt. Then, say the writers of his acts, we took up the bones, more precious than the richest jewels or gold, and deposited them in a fitting place, at which may God grant us to assemble with joy to celebrate the birthday of the martyr to his life in heaven. Reflection If we love Jesus Christ, we shall love the church and hate heresy, which rends his mystical body and destroys the souls for which he died. Like St. Polycarp, we shall maintain our constancy in the faith by love of Jesus Christ, who is its author and its finisher. January 27th, St. John Chrysostom St. John was born at Antioch in 344. In order to break with a world which admired and courted him, he, in 374, retired for six years to a neighboring mountain. Having thus acquired the art of Christian silence, he returned to Antioch and there labored as priest until he was ordained bishop of Constantinople in 398. The effect of his sermons was everywhere marvelous. He was very urgent that his people should frequent the holy sacrifice, and in order to remove all excuse, he abbreviated the long liturgy until then in use. St. Nellis relates that St. John Chrysostom was wont to see, when the priest began the holy sacrifice, many of the blessed ones coming down from heaven in shining garments and with bare feet, eyes intent, and bowed heads, in utter silence and stillness, assisting at the consummation of the tremendous mystery. Beloved as he was in Constantinople, his denunciations of vice made him numerous enemies. In 403 these procured his banishment, and although he was almost immediately recalled, it was not more than a reprieve. In 404 he was banished to Cucuscus in the deserts of Tarsus. In 407 he was wearing out, but his enemies were impatient. They hurried him off to Pisius on the Euxine, a rough journey of nigh four hundred miles. He was assiduously exposed to every hardship, cold, wet, semi-starvation, but nothing could overcome his cheerfulness and his consideration for others. On the journey his sickness increased, and he was warned that his end was nigh. Thereupon, exchanging his travel-stained clothes for white garments, he received viaticum 
and with his customary words, Glory be to God for all things. Amen. Passed to Christ. Reflection We should try to understand that the most productive work in the whole day, both for time and eternity, is that involved in hearing Mass. St. John Chrysostom felt this so keenly that he allowed no consideration of venerable usage to interfere with the easiness of hearing Mass. January 28th, St. Cyril of Alexandria St. Cyril became Patriarch of Alexandria in 412. Having at first thrown himself with ardor into the party politics of the place, God called him to a nobler conflict. In 428, Nestorius, Bishop of Constantinople, began to deny the unity of person in Christ and to refuse to the Blessed Virgin the title of Mother of God. He was strongly supported by disciples and friends throughout the East. As the assertion of the divine maternity of our Lord was necessary to the integrity of the doctrine of the Incarnation, so with St. Cyril devotion to the Mother was a necessary complement of his devotion to the Son. St. Cyril, after expostulating in vain, accused Nestorius to Pope Celestine. The Pope commanded retraction, under pain of separation from the Church, and entrusted St. Cyril with the conduct of the proceedings. The appointed day, June 7, 431, found Nestorius and Cyril at Ephesus with over two hundred bishops. After waiting twelve days in vain for the Syrian bishops, the council with Cyril tried Nestorius and deposed him from his see. Upon this, the Syrians and Nestorians excommunicated St. Cyril and complained of him to the emperor as a peacebreaker. Imprisoned and threatened with banishment, the saint rejoiced to confess Christ by suffering. In time it was recognized that St. Cyril was right, and with him the church triumphed. Forgetting his wrongs and careless of controversial punctilio, Cyril then reconciled himself with all who would consent to hold the doctrine of the Incarnation intact. He died in 444. Reflection The Incarnation is the mystery of God's dwelling within us and therefore should be the dearest object of our contemplation. It was the passion of St. Cyril's life. For it he underwent toil and persecution and willingly sacrificed credit and friends. January 29th, St. Francis of Sales Francis was born of noble and pious parents near Annecy, A.D. 1566, and studied with brilliant success at Paris, and Padua. On his return from Italy, he gave up the grand career which his father had marked out for him in the service of the state, and became a priest. When the Duke of Savoy had resolved to restore the church in the Chablis, Francis offered himself for the work and set out on foot with his Bible and breviary and one companion, his cousin, Louis of Sales. It was a work of toil, privation, and danger. Every door and every heart was closed against him. He was rejected with insult and threatened with death, but nothing could daunt or resist him, and ere long the church burst forth into a second spring. It is stated that he converted 72,000 Calvinists. He was then compelled by the Pope to become coadjutor bishop of Ge uh, Geneva and succeeded to the C.A.D. 1602. At times, the exceeding gentleness with which he received heretics and sinners almost scandalized his friends, and one of them said to him, Francis of Sales will go to paradise, of course, but I am not so sure of the Bishop of Geneva. I am almost afraid his gentleness will play him a shrewd turn. Ah, said the saint, I would rather account to God for too great gentleness than for too great severity. Is not God all love? God the Father is the Father of mercy. God the Son is a lamb. God the Holy Ghost is a dove. That is gentleness itself. And are you wiser than God? In union with St. Jane Francis of Chantal, he founded at Annecy the Order of Visitation, 
which soon spread over Europe. Though poor, he refused provisions and dignities, and even the great sea of Paris. He died at Avignon, A.D. 1622. Reflection You will catch more flies, St. Francis used to say, with a spoonful of honey than with a hundred barrels of vinegar. Were there anything better or fairer on earth than gentleness, Jesus Christ would have taught it us, and yet he has given us the only two lessons to learn of him, meekness and humility of heart. January 30th, St. Bathildus, Queen St. Bathildus was an Englishwoman who was carried over, whilst yet young, into France, and there sold for a slave at a very low price to Erkenwald, mayor of the palace under King Clovis II. When she grew up, her master was so much taken with her prudence and virtue that he placed her in charge of his household. The renown of her virtue spread through all France, and King Clovis II took her for his royal consort. This unexpected elevation produced no alteration in a heart perfectly grounded in humility and the other virtues, she seemed to become even more humble than before. Her new station furnished her the means of being truly a mother to the poor. The king gave her the sanction of his royal authority for the protection of the church, the care of the poor, and the furtherance of all religious undertakings. The death of her husband left her regent of the kingdom. She at once forbade the enslavement of Christians, did all in her power to promote piety, and fill France with hospitals and religious houses. As soon as her son, Clotaire, was of an age to govern, she withdrew from the world and entered the convent of Chelet. Here she seemed entirely to forget her worldly dignity and was to be distinguished from the rest of the community only by her extreme humility, her ob obedience to her spiritual superiors, and her devotion to the sick whom she comforted and served with wonderful charity. As she neared her end, God visited her with a severe illness, which she bore with Christian patience, until on the 30th of January, 680, she yielded up her soul in devout prayer. Reflection In all that we do, let God and His holy will be always before our eyes, and our only aim and desire be to please Him. January 31st, St. Marcella, Widow St. Marcella, whom St. Jerome called the glory of the Roman women, became a widow in the seventh month after her marriage. Having determined to consecrate the remainder of her days to the service of God, she rejected the hand of Cyrillus, the council, uncle of Gallus Caesar, and resolved to imitate the lives of the ascetics of the East. She abstained from wine and flesh meat, employed all her time in pious reading, prayer, and visiting the churches, and never spoke with any man alone. Her example was followed by many who put themselves under her direction, and Rome was in a short time filled with monasteries. When the Goths under Alaric plundered Rome in 410, our saint suffered severely at the hands of the barbarian who cruelly scourged her in order to make her reveal the treasures which she had long before distributed in charity. She trembled only, however, for the innocence of her dear spiritual daughter, Principia, and falling at the feet of the cruel soldiers, she begged with many tears that they would offer no insult to that pure virgin. God moved them to compassion, and they conducted our saint and her pupil to the church of St. Paul, to which Alaric had granted the right of sanctuary with that of St. Peter. St. Marcella, who survived this but a short time, closed her eyes to a happy death in the arms of St. Principia at the end of August, 410. February 1st, St. Brigid, Abbess and Patroness of Ireland Next to the glorious St. Patrick, St. Brigid, whom we may consider his spiritual daughter in Christ, has ever been held in singular veneration in Ireland. 
She was born about the year 453 at Fouchard in Ulster. During her infancy, her pious father saw in a vision men clothed in white garments pouring a sacred unguent on her head, thus prefiguring her future sanctity. While yet very young, Bridget consecrated her life to God, bestowed everything at her disposal on the poor, and was the edification of all who knew her. She was very beautiful, and fearing that efforts might be made to induce her to break the vow by which she had bound herself to God, and to bestow her hand on one of her many suitors, she prayed that she might become ugly and deformed. Her prayer was heard, for her eye became swollen and her whole continent so changed that she was allowed to follow her vocation in peace, and marriage with her was no more thought of. When about twenty years old, our saint made known to St. Mel, the nephew and disciple of St. Patrick, her intention to live only to Jesus Christ, and he consented to receive her sacred vows. On the appointed day the solemn ceremony of her profession was performed after the manner introduced by St. Patrick, the bishop offering up many prayers and investing Bridget with a snow-white habit and a cloak of the same color. While she bowed her head on this occasion to receive the veil, a miracle of a singularly striking and impressive nature occurred. That part of the wooden platform adjoining the altar on which she knelt recovered its original vitality and put on all its former verdure retaining it for a long time after. At the same time, Bridget's eye was healed, and she became as beautiful and as lovely as ever. Encouraged by her example, several other ladies made their vows with her, and in compliance with the wish of the parents of her new associates, the saint agreed to found a religious residence for herself and them in the vicinity. A convenient site having been fixed upon by the bishop, a convent, the first in Ireland, was erected upon it, and in obedience to the prelate, Bridget assumed the superiority. Her reputation for sanctity became greater every day, and in proportion as it was diffused throughout the country, the number of candidates for admission into the new monastery increased. The bishops of Ireland, soon perceiving the important advantages which their respective dioceses would derive from similar foundations, persuaded the young and saintly abbess to visit different parts of the kingdom, and as an opportunity offered, introduced into each one the establishment of her institute. While thus engaged in a portion of the province of Connaught, a deputation arrived from Leinster to solicit the saint to take up her residence in that territory. But the motives which they urged were human, and such could have no weight with Bridget. It was only the prospect of the many spiritual advantages that would result from compliance with the request that induced her to accede, as she did to the wishes of those who had petitioned her. Taking with her a number of her spiritual daughters, our saint journeyed to Leinster, where they were received with many demonstrations of respect and joy. The site on which Kildare now stands appearing to be well adapted for a religious institute, there the saint and her companions took up their abode. To the place appropriated for the new foundation, some lands were annexed, the fruits of which were assigned to the little establishment. This donation indeed contributed to supply the wants of the community, but still the pious sisterhood principally depended for their maintenance on the liberality of their benefactors. Bridget contrived, however, out of their small means, to relieve the poor of the vicinity very considerably, and when the wants of these indigent persons surpassed her slender finances, she hesitated not to sacrifice for them the movables of the convent. On one occasion our saint, imitating the burning charity of St. Ambrose and other great servants of God, sold some of the sacred vestments that she might procure the means of relieving their necessities. She was so humble that she sometimes attended the cattle on the land which belonged to her monastery. The renown of Bridget's unbounded charity drew multitudes of the poor to Kildare. The fame of her piety attracted thither many persons anxious to solicit her prayers, 
or to profit by her holy example. In course of time, the number of these so much increased that it became necessary to provide accommodation for them in the neighborhood of the new monastery, and thus was laid the foundation and origin of the town of Kildare. The spiritual exigencies of her community and of those numerous strangers who resorted to the vicinity, having suggested to our saint the expediency of having the locality erected into an episcopal see, she represented it to the prelates, to whom the consideration of it rightly belonged. Deeming the proposal just and useful, Conleth, a recluse of eminent sanctity, illustrious by the great things which God had granted to his prayers, was, at Bridget's desire, chosen the first bishop of the newly erected diocese. In process of time, it became the ecclesiastical metropolis of the province to which it belonged, probably in consequence of the general desire to honor the place in which St. Bridget had so long dwelt. After seventy years devoted to the practice of the most sublime virtues, corporal infirmities admonished our saint that the time of her dissolution was nigh. It was now half a century since, by her holy vows, she had irrevocably consecrated herself to God, and during that period great results had been attained. Her holy institute, having widely diffused itself throughout the Green Isle, and greatly advanced the cause of religion in the various districts in which it was established. Like a river of peace, its progress was steady and silent. It fertilized every region fortunate enough to receive its waters, and caused it to put forth spiritual flowers and fruits with all the sweet perfume of evangelical fragrance. The remembrance of the glory she had procured to the Most High as well as the services rendered to dear souls ransomed by the precious blood of her divine spouse, cheered and consoled Bridget in the infirmities inseparable from old age. Her last illness was soothed by the presence of Ninid, a priest of eminent sanctity, over whose youth she had watched with pious solicitude, and who was indebted to her prayers and instructions for his great proficiency in sublime perfection. The day on which our abbess was to terminate her course, February 1st, 523, having arrived, she received from the hands of this saintly priest the blessed body and blood of our Lord in the divine Eucharist, and, as it would seem, immediately after her spirit passed forth and went to possess him in that heavenly country where he is seen face to face and enjoyed without danger of ever losing him. Her body was interred in the church adjoining her convent, but was some time after exhumed and deposited in a splendid shrine near the high altar. In the ninth century, the country being desolated by the Danes, the remains of St. Bridget were removed in order to secure them from irreverence, and being transferred to Downpatrick, were deposited in the same grave with those of the glorious St. Patrick. Their bodies, together with that of St. Columba, were translated afterwards to the cathedral of the same city, but their monument was destroyed in the reign of King Henry VIII. The head of St. Bridget is now kept in the Church of the Jesuits at Lisbon. Reflection Outward resemblance to Our Lady was St. Bridget's peculiar privilege, but all are bound to grow like her in interior purity of heart. This grace St. Bridget has obtained in a wonderful degree for the daughters of her native land, and will never fail to procure for all her devout clients. Also February 1st, St. Ignatius, Bishop and Martyr St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, was the disciple of St. John. When Domitian persecuted the church, St. Ignatius obtained peace for his own flock by fasting and prayer. But for his part, he desired to suffer with Christ and to prove himself a perfect disciple. In the year 107, Trajan came to Antioch and forced the Christians to choose between apostasy and death. Who art thou, poor devil, the emperor said, when Ignatius was brought before him, who settest our commands at naught? 
Call not him poor devil, Ignatius answered, who bears God within him. And when the emperor questioned him about his meaning, Ignatius explained that he bore in his heart Christ crucified for his sake. Thereupon the emperor condemned him to be torn to pieces by wild beasts at Rome. St. Ignatius thanked God, who had so honored him, binding him in the chains of Paul, his apostle. He journeyed to Rome, guarded by soldiers, and with no fear except of losing the martyr's crown. He was devoured by lions in the Roman amphitheater. The wild beasts left nothing of his body except a few bones, which were reverently treasured at Antioch until their removal to the church of St. Clement at Rome in 637. After the martyr's death, several Christians saw him in vision standing before Christ and interceding for them. Reflection Ask St. Ignatius to obtain for you the grace of profiting by all you have to suffer, and rejoicing in it as a means of likeness to your crucified Redeemer. February 2nd, the Purification, commonly called Candlemas Day. The law of God given by Moses to the Jews ordained that a woman, after childbirth, should continue for a certain time in a state which that law calls unclean, during which she was not to appear in public, nor presume to touch anything consecrated to God. This term was of forty days upon the birth of a son, and double that time for a daughter. On the expiration of the term the mother was to bring to the door of the tabernacle, or temple, a lamb and a young pigeon, or turtle dove, as an offering to God. These being sacrificed to Almighty God by the priest, the woman was cleansed of the legal impurity and reinstated in her former privileges. A young pigeon or turtle dove by way of a sin offering was required of all, whether rich or poor, but as the expense of a lamb might be too great for persons in poor circumstances, they were allowed to substitute for it a second dove. Our Savior, having been conceived by the Holy Ghost and His Blessed Mother, remaining always a spotless virgin, it is evident that she did not come under the law, but as the world was as yet ignorant of her miraculous conception, she submitted with great punctuality and exactness to every humbling circumstance which the law required. Devotion and zeal to honor God, by every observance prescribed by His law, prompted Mary to perform this act of religion, though evidently exempt from the precept. Being poor herself, she made the offering appointed for the poor, but, however mean in itself, it was made with a perfect heart, which is what God chiefly regards in all that is offered to Him. Besides the law which obliged the mother to purify herself, there was another which ordered that the firstborn son should be offered to God, and that after its presentation the child should be ransomed with a certain sum of money, and peculiar sacrifices offered on the occasion. Mary complies with exactly with all these ordinances. She obeys not only in the essential points of the law, but has strict regard to all the circumstances. She remains forty days at home. She denies herself all this time the liberty of entering the temple. She partakes not of things sacred. And on the day of her purification she walks several miles to Jerusalem with the world's Redeemer in her arms. She waits for the priest at the gate of the temple, makes her offerings of thanksgiving and expiation, presents her divine Son by the hands of the priest to his eternal Father with the most profound humility, adoration, and thanksgiving. She then redeems him with five shekels, as the law appoints, and receives him back again as a sacred charge committed to her special care, till the Father shall again demand him for the full accomplishment of man's redemption. The ceremony of this day was closed by a third mystery, the meeting in the temple of the holy persons Simeon and Anne with Jesus and his parents. Holy Simeon, on that occasion, received into his arms the object of all his desires and sighs, and praised God for being blessed with the happiness of beholding the so much longed-for Messiah. He foretold to Mary 
her martyrdom of sorrow, and that Jesus brought redemption to those who would accept of it on the terms it was offered at them, but a heavy judgment on all infidels who should obstinately reject it, and on Christians also whose lives were a contradiction to his holy maxims and example. Mary, hearing this terrible prediction, did not answer one word, felt no agitation of mind from the present, no dread for the future, but courageously and sweetly committed all to God's holy will. Anne also, the prophetess, who in her widowhood served God with great fervor, had the happiness to acknowledge and adore in this great mystery the Redeemer of the world. Simeon, having beheld our Savior, exclaimed, Now dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word, because my eyes have seen thy salvation. This feast is called Candlemas, because the church blesses the candles to be born in the procession of the day. Reflection Let us strive to imitate the humility of the ever-blessed Mother of God, remembering that humility is the path which leads to abiding peace and brings us near to the consolations of God. February 3rd, St. Blaise, Bishop and Martyr St. Blaise devoted the earlier years of his life to the study of philosophy and afterwards became a physician. In the practice of his profession he saw so much of the miseries of life and the hollowness of worldly pleasures that he resolved to spend the rest of his days in the service of God, and from being a healer of bodily ailments to become a physician of souls. The bishop of Sebast in Armenia, having died, our saint, much to the gratification of the inhabitants of that city, was appointed to succeed him. St. Blaise at once began to instruct his people as much by example as by his words, and the great virtues and sanctity of this servant of God were attested by many miracles. From all parts the people came flocking to him for the cure of bodily and spiritual ills. Agricolus, governor of Cappadocia and the Lesser Armenia, having begun a persecution by order of the emperor Licinius, our, our saint was seized and hurried off to prison. While on his way there a distracted mother, whose only child was dying of a throat disease, threw herself at the feet of St. Blaise and implored his intercession. Touched at her grief, the saint offered up his prayers, and the child was cured, and since that time his aid has been effectually solicited in cases of a similar disease. Refusing to worship the false gods of the heathens, St. Blaise was first scourged, his body was then torn with hooks, and finally he was beheaded in the year 316. Reflection There is no sacrifice which, by the aid of grace, human nature is not capable of accomplishing. When St. Paul complained to God of the violence of the temptation, God answered, My grace is sufficient for thee, for power is made perfect in infirmity. February 4th, St. Jane of Valois Born of the blood royal of France, herself a queen, Jane of Valois led a life remarkable for its humiliations, even in the annals of the saints. Her father, Louis the Eleventh, who had hoped for a son to succeed him, banished Jane from his palace, and, as said, even attempted her life. At the age of five the neglected child offered her whole heart to God, and yearned to do some special service in honor of his blessed mother. At the king's wish, though against her own inclination, she was married to the Duke of Orleans. Towards an indifferent and unworthy husband, her conduct was ever most patient and dutiful. Her prayers and tears saved him from a traitor's death, and shortened the captivity which his rebellion had merited. Still nothing could win a heart which was already given to another. When her husband ascended the throne, as Louis the Twelfth, his first act was to repudiate by false representations one who through twenty-two years of cruel neglect had been his true and loyal wife. At the final sentence of separation, the saintly queen exclaimed, God be praised, who has allowed this, that I may serve him better than I have heretofore done. 
Retiring to Bourget, she there realized her long-formed desire of founding the Order of the Annunciation in honor of the Mother of God. Under the guidance of St. Francis of Paula, the director of her childhood, St. Jane was enabled to overcome the serious obstacles which even good people raised against the foundation of her new order. In 1501, the rule of the Annunciation was finally approved by Alexander VI. The chief aim of the Institute was to imitate the ten virtues practiced by Our Lady in the mystery of the Incarnation, the superioress being called Ansel, handmaid, in honor of Mary's humility. St. Jane built and endowed the first convent of the order in 1502. She died in heroic sanctity A.D. 1505 and was buried in the royal crown and purple beneath which lay the habit of her order. Reflection During the lifetime of St. Jane, the Angelus was established in France. The sound of the Ave thrice each day gave her hope in her sorrow and fostered in her the desire still further to honor the Incarnation. How often might we derive grace from the same beautiful devotion, so enriched by the Church, yet neglected by so many Christians? February 5th, St. Agatha, Virgin, Martyr St. Agatha was born in Sicily, of rich and noble parents, a child of benediction from the first, for she was promised to her parents before her birth and consecrated from her earliest infancy to God. In the midst of dangers and temptations, she served Christ in purity of body and soul, and she died for the love of chastity. Quintanus, who governed Sicily under the emperor Decius, had heard the rumor of her beauty and wealth, and he made the laws against the Christians a pretext for summoning her from Palermo to Catania, where he was at the time. O oh, Jesus Christ, she said, as she set out on this dreaded journey, all that I am is thine. Preserve me against the tyrant. And our Lord did indeed preserve one who had given herself so utterly to him. He kept her pure and undefiled while she was imprisoned, for a whole month under charge of an evil woman. He gave her strength to reply to the offer of her life and safety, if she would but consent to sin. Christ alone is my life and my salvation. When Quintanus turned from passion to cruelty and cut off her breasts, our Lord sent the prince of his apostles to heal her. And when, after she had been rolled naked upon potsherds, she asked that her torments might be ended, her spouse heard her prayer and took her to himself. St. Agatha gave herself without reserve to Jesus Christ. She followed him in virginal purity and then looked to him for protection. And down to this day Christ has shown his tender regard for the very body of St. Agatha. Again and again, during the eruptions of Mount Etna, the people of Catania have exposed her veil for public veneration and found safety by this means. And in modern times, on opening the tomb in which her body lies waiting for the resurrection, they beheld the skin still entire and felt the sweet fragrance which issued from this temple of the Holy Ghost. Reflection Purity is a gift of God. We can gain it and preserve it only by care and diligence in avoiding all that may prove an incentive to sin. Also February 5th, the Martyrs of Japan. About forty years after St. Francis Xavier's death, a persecution broke out in Japan, and all Christian rites were forbidden under pain of death. A confraternity of martyrs was at once formed, the object of which was to die for Christ. Even the little children joined it. Peter, a Christian child six years old, was awakened early and told that he was to be beheaded together with his father. Strong in grace, he expressed his joy at the news, dressed himself in his gayest clothing, and took the hand of the soldier who was to lead him to death. The headless trunk of his father first met his view. Calmly kneeling down, he prayed beside the corpse, and loosening his collar, prepared his neck for the stroke. Moved by this touching scene, 
the executioner drew down his saber and fled. None but a brutal slave could be found for the murderous task. With unskilled and trembling hand he hacked the child to pieces, who at last died without uttering a single cry. Christians were branded with the cross, or all but buried alive, while the head and arms were slowly sawn off with blunt weapons. The least shudder under their anguish was interpreted into apostasy. The obstinate were put to the most cruel deaths, but the survivors only envied them. Five noblemen were escorted to the stake by forty thousand Christians with flowers and lights, singing the litanies of Our Lady as they went. In the great martyrdom, at which thousands also assisted, the martyrs sent up a flood of melody from the fire, which only died away as one after another went to sing the new song in heaven. Later on, a more awful doom was invented. The victims were lowered into a sulfurous chasm called the Mouth of Hell, near which no bird or beast could live. The chief of these, Paul Weiberg, whose family had been already massacred for the faith, was thrice let down. Thrice he cried with a loud voice, Eternal praise be to the ever-adorable sacrament of the altar. The third time he went to his reward. Reflection If mere children face torture and death with joy for Christ, can we begrudge the slight penance he asks us to bear? February 6th, St. Dorothy, Virgin, Martyr St. Dorothy was a young virgin celebrated at Caesarea where she lived for her angelic virtue. Her parents seemed to have been martyred before her in the Diocletian persecution, and when the governor, Sapricius, came to Caesarea, he called her before him and sent this child of martyrs to the home where they were waiting for her. She was stretched upon the rack and offered marriage if she would consent to sacrifice or death if she refused. But she replied that Christ was her only spouse and death her desire. She was then placed in charge of two women who had fallen away from the faith in the hope that they might pervert her, but the fire of her own heart rekindled the flame in theirs and led them back to Christ. When she was set once more on the rack, Sapricius himself was amazed at the heavenly look she wore and asked her the cause of her joy. Because, she said, I have brought back two souls to Christ, and because I shall soon be in heaven rejoicing with the angels. Her joy grew as she was buffeted in the face and her sides burned with plates of red-hot iron. Blessed be thou, she cried, when she was sentenced to be beheaded. Blessed be thou, O thou lover of souls, who dost call me to paradise and invitest me to thy nuptial chamber. St. Dorothy suffered in the dead of winter, and it is said that on the road to her passion a lawyer called Theophilus, who had been used to calumniate and persecute the Christians, asked her in mockery to send him apples or roses from the garden of her spouse. The saint promised to grant his request, and just before she died a little child stood by her side bearing three apples and three roses. She bade him take them to Theophilus and tell him this was a present which she sought from the garden of her spouse. St. Dorothy had gone to heaven, and Theophilus was still making merry over his challenge to the saint when the child entered his room. He saw that the child was an angel in disguise, and the fruit and flowers of no earthly growth. He was converted to the faith, and then shared in the martyrdom of St. Dorothy. Reflection do you wish to be safe in the pleasures and happy in the troubles of this world? Pray for heavenly desires, and say with St. Philip, Paradise, Paradise. February 7th, St. Romwald, Abbot In 976, 976, Sergius, a nobleman of Ravenna, quarreled with a relative about an estate and slew him in a duel. His son, Romwald, horrified at his father's crime, entered the Benedictine monastery at Classe to do a forty days' penance for him. This penance ended in his own vocation to religion. After three years at Classe, Romwald went to live as a hermit near Venice, 
where he was joined by Peter Osolius, Duke of Venice, and together they led a most austere life in the midst of assaults from the evil spirits. St. Romuald founded many monasteries, the chief of which was that at Camaldoli, a wild desert place, where he built a church which he surrounded with a number of separate cells for the solitaries who lived under his rule. His disciples were thence called Camadolis. He is said to have seen there a vision of a mystic ladder and his white-clothed monks ascending by it to heaven. Among his first disciples were Saints Adalbert and Boniface, apostles of Russia, and Saints John and Benedict of Poland, martyrs for the faith. He was an intimate friend of the Emperor St. Henry, and was reverenced and consulted by many great men of his time. He once passed seven years in solitude and complete silence. In his youth St. Romwald was much troubled by temptations of the flesh. To escape them he had recourse to hunting, and in the woods first conceived his love for solitude. His father's sin, as we have seen, first prompted him to undertake a forty days' penance in the monastery, which he forthwith made his home. Some bad example of his fellow monks induced him to leave them and adopt the solitary mode of life. The penance of Ursulius, who had obtained his power wrongfully, brought him his first disciple. The temptations of the devil compelled him to his severe life. And finally, the persecutions of others were the occasion of his settlement at Camaldoli, and the foundation of his order. He died, as he had foretold twenty years before, alone in his monastery of Val Castro on the 19th of June, 1027. Reflection St. Romuald's life teaches us that if we only follow the impulses of the Holy Spirit, we shall easily find good everywhere, even on the most unlikely occasions. Our own sins, the sins of others, their ill will against us, or our own mistakes and misfortunes, are equally capable of leading us with softened hearts to the feet of God's mercy and love. February 8th, St. John of Matha The life of St. John of Matha was one long course of self-sacrifice for the glory of God and the good of his neighbor. As a child, his chief delight was serving the poor, and he often told them he had come into the world for no other end but to wash their feet. He studied at Paris with such distinction that his professors advised him to become a priest, in order that his talents might render greater service to others. And for this end, John gladly sacrificed his high rank and other worldly advantages. At his first Mass, an angel appeared, clad in white, with a red and blue cross on his breast, and his hands reposing on the heads of a Christian and a Moorish captive. To ascertain what this signified, John repaired to St. Felix of Valois, a holy hermit living near Mew, under whose direction he led a life of extreme penance. The angel again appeared, and they then set out for Rome to learn the will of God from the lips of the sovereign pontiff, who told them to devote themselves to the redemption of captives. For this purpose they founded the Order of the Holy Trinity. The religious fasted every day, and gathering alms throughout Europe took them to Barbary to redeem the Christian slaves. They devoted themselves also to the sick and prisoners in all countries. The charity of St. John in devoting his life to the redemption of captives was visibly blessed by God. On his second return from Tunis, he brought back one hundred and twenty liberated slaves. But the Moors attacked him at sea, overpowered his vessel, and doomed it to destruction with all on board by taking away the rudder and sails and leaving it to the mercy of the winds. St. John tied his cloak to the mast and prayed, saying, Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered. O Lord, thou wilt save the humble, and will bring down the eye of the proud. Suddenly the wind filled the small sail, and without guidance carried the ship safely in a few days to Ostia, the port of Rome, three hundred leagues from Tunis. Worn out by his heroic labors, 
John died in 1213 at the age of 53. Reflection Let us never forget that our blessed Lord bade us love our neighbor not only as ourselves, but as he loved us, who afterward sacrificed himself for us. February 9th St. Apollonia and the Martyrs of Alexandria At Alexandria, in 249, the mob rose in savage fury against the Christians. Metris, an old man, perished first. His eyes were pierced with reeds, and he was stoned to death. A woman named Quinta was the next victim. She was led to a heathen temple and bidden worship. She replied by cursing the false god again and again, and she too was stoned to death. After this the houses of the Christians were sacked and plundered. They took the spoiling of their goods with all joy. St. Apollonia, an aged virgin, was the most famous among the martyrs. Her teeth were beaten out, she was led outside the city, a huge fire was kindled, and she was told she must deny Christ or else be burned alive. She was silent for a while, and then moved by a special inspiration of the Holy Ghost, she leaped into the fire and died in its flames. The same courage showed itself the next year, when Decius became emperor, and the persecution grew till it seemed as if the very elect must fall away. The story of Dioscorsus illustrates the courage of the Alexandrian Christians and the esteem they had for martyrdom. He was a boy of fifteen. To the arguments of the judge he returned wise answers. He was proof against torture. His older companions were executed, but Dioscorsus was spared on account of his tender years. Yet the Christians could not bear to think that he had been deprived of the martyr's crown except to receive it afterwards more gloriously. Dioscorsus, wrote Dionysius, bishop of Alexandria at this time, remains with us, reserved for some longer and greater combat. There were indeed many Christians who came, pale and trembling, to offer the heathen sacrifices, but the judges themselves were struck with horror at the multitudes who rushed to martyrdom. Women triumphed over torture, till at last the judges were glad to execute them at once and put an end to the ignominy of their own defeat. Reflection Many saints who are not martyrs have longed to shed their blood for Christ. We, too, may pray for some portion of their spirit and the least suffering for the faith, born with humility and courage, is the proof that Christ has heard our prayer. February 10th Saint Scholastica, Abbess. Of this saint but little is known on earth, save that she was the sister of the great patriarch Saint Benedict, and that under his direction she founded and governed a numerous community near Monte Cassino. Saint Gregory sums up her life by saying that she devoted herself to God from her childhood, and that her pure soul went to God in the likeness of a dove, as if to show that her life had been enriched with the fullest gifts of the Holy Spirit. Her brother was accustomed to visit her once every year, for she could not be sated or wearied with the words of grace which flowed from his lips. On his last visit, after a day passed in spiritual converse, the saint, knowing that her end was near, said, My brother, leave me not, I pray you, this night, but discourse with me till dawn on the bliss of those who see God in heaven. St. Benedict would not break his rule at the bidding of natural affection, and then the saint bowed her head on her hands and prayed, and there arose a storm so violent that St. Benedict could not return to his monastery, and they passed the night in heavenly conversation. Three days later St. Benedict saw in a vision the soul of his sister going up in the likeness of a dove into heaven. Then he gave thanks to God for the graces he had given her, and for the glory which had crowned them. When she died, St. Benedict, her spiritual daughters, and the monks sent by St. Benedict, mingled their tears and prayed, Alas, alas, dearest mother, to whom dost thou leave us now? Pray for us to Jesus, to whom thou art gone. They then devoutly celebrated Holy Mass, commending her soul to God, and her body was borne to Monte Cassino 
and laid by her brother in the tomb he had prepared for himself. And they bewailed her many days, and St. Benedict said, Weep not, sisters and brothers, for assuredly Jesus has taken her before us to be our aid and defense against all our enemies, that we may stand in the evil day and be in all things perfect. She died about the year 543. Reflection Our relatives must be loved in and for God, otherwise the purest affection becomes inordinate and is so much taken from Him. February 11th, St. Severinus, Abbot of Agiunum. St. Severinus, of a noble family in Burgundy, was educated in the Catholic faith at a time when the Arian heresy reigned in that country. He forsook the world in his youth and dedicated himself to God in the monastery of Agiunum, which then only consisted of scattered cells, till the Catholic king Sigismund built there the great abbey of St. Maurice. St. Severinus was the holy abbot of that place, and had governed this community many years in the exercise of penance and charity, when in 504 Clovis, the first Christian king of France, lying ill of a fever, which his physicians had for two years ineffectually endeavored to remove, sent his chamberlain to conduct the saint to court. For it was said that the sick from all parts recovered their health by his prayers. St. Severinus took leave of his monks, telling them he should never see them more in this world. On his journey, he healed Euelis, bishop of Nevers, who had been for some time deaf and dumb, also a leper at the gates of Paris, and coming to the palace, he immediately restored the king to perfect health by putting him on him his own cloak. The king, in gratitude, distributed large alms to the poor and released all his prisoners. St. Severinus, returning toward Agayunum, stopped at Chateau Landon in Gatonois, where two priests served God in a solitary chapel, among whom he was admitted, at his request as a stranger, and was soon greatly admired by them for his sanctity. He foresaw his death, which happened shortly after, in 507. The place is now an abbey of Reformed Canons Regular of St. Austin. The Huguenots scattered the greater part of his relics when they plundered this church. Reflection God loads with his favor those who delight in exercising mercy. According to thy ability, be merciful. If thou hast much, give abundantly. If thou hast little, take care even so to bestow willingly a little.